Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Glidewell. Over the last 30 years, research on sleep and sleep problems has resulted in an explosion in our understanding of the factors that lead us to sleep poorly and how to reclaim healthy sleep. Let's start with the basics. First, the more you understand about sleep, the more you'll be able to influence it. So, let's talk a little bit about how much sleep you need and what your brain is doing during sleep. How much sleep do you really need? Throughout life, the amount and organization of sleep changes, and everyone seems to have a different need, so there's no right answer to this question. But in general, as adults, most of us need between seven and nine hours to feel well, function well, and stay healthy. Now, let's look at what your brain is doing while you're asleep. There are two very different types of sleep rapid eye movement, or REM sleep, and non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep is divided into three stages. In light sleep, when your brain slows down and it's easy to wake you up, you're in stage one or two non-REM sleep. When your brain slows way down and you become hard to wake up, you're in stage three non-REM, or deep sleep. REM sleep is a whole different animal. When your brain speeds up, your eyes start wiggling back and forth, and your brain cuts off control to your muscles, you're in REM sleep. This is also where you're most likely to have your most vivid and memorable dreams. Now, one of the most common questions I get is, what type of sleep is best? There are a lot of myths that one type of sleep is better than another, but really, we need all of them. About every 90 minutes, our brain cycles through all of the stages, and what we most need is to get as many complete cycles of sleep as we can. Now that you know some of the basics of sleep, what can you do to actually change it? The activities you choose throughout the day and evening, what you put into your body and when, and the bedroom environment you create can have a major influence on your sleep at night and how you feel during the day. Following healthy sleep habits sets the stage for a natural great night of sleep. There are six primary healthy sleep habits. The first one has to do with what Murray Carpenter is calling America's drug of choice. A tablespoon will kill you but it's sold over the counter and can be found in many of the items you buy every day at the grocery store. It's regulated in drugs by pharmaceutical companies, but has no limits when it's put in food. What is it? Caffeine. It's found all over the place. Coffees, teas, soft drinks, chocolate, energy drinks, pain relievers, supplements, and we use a lot of it. Worldwide, we consume 20,000 Coca-Cola soft drinks every second. That's 1.7 billion every day. We especially like it when it comes in coffee. 54% of Americans drink coffee every day and average 3.19 ounce cups of coffee per day. We like it so much, we spend $40 billion a year on it. How much coffee do you drink each day? How many cups of coffee or sodas or energy drinks? Be honest. When you say two cups, do you mean two cups? Or do you mean two cups? Why do you drink it? Because it tastes good? Hopefully. But you probably also drink it because it's a neuro enhancer. It makes you feel good. Through its effects on the brain, it makes you feel more alert, more focused, more energetic, and in a better mood. This is great when we want to be awake, but it's a problem when we would rather be sleeping. One way caffeine makes us feel good is by blocking a chemical called adenosine. Adenosine builds up in the brain while you're awake. The longer you're awake, the more you have, and the more you have, the sleepier, sleepier you'll feel when bedtime comes. This chemical is also responsible for helping you fall asleep quickly, stay asleep, and sleep deeply. Because of this, when it comes to sleep, the general recommendation is no caffeine within six hours of bedtime. 
But my friend Chris Drake recently published a study that showed that caffeine, even six hours before bed, led to disrupted sleep. So what are you to do? Well, your sensitivity to caffeine is unique to you. You may say, I'm still wired at bedtime if I drink a sip of caffeine after 10 a.m. If this is the case, then you should respect that and avoid caffeine after 10 a.m. On the other hand, you may say something like, I drink a cup of coffee at di after dinner each night and I'm fine. Well, Dr. Drake's research also found that most people were not aware of the disruptive effects of caffeine on their sleep. What this means is that caffeine may have effects on your sleep that aren't obvious or don't make sense. So, whatever you believe about the effect of caffeine consumption on your sleep, if you're having trouble sleeping, the only way you can really know if caffeine is part of the problem is to stop using it for a while. How do you do this? Well, that's a bit beyond this video, but let me assure you it can be done. If you go to the website caffeineinformer.com and search for detox, they will show you a couple of ways to go about getting off of caffeine. They'll also give you a bunch of reasons, other than better sleep, why it's a good idea. Next is alcohol. Alcohol is tricky. Like caffeine, its effects on sleep can be difficult to see. What makes alcohol even trickier is that it works on the same part of the brain as sleeping pills. So, as you've probably noticed if you've ever drank alcohol around bedtime, it can actually cause sleepiness and make it easier to fall asleep. The problem is that although alcohol may help sleep at the beginning of the night, it changes sleep in a way that leads to more broken and restless sleep in the latter half of the night when its effects begin to wear off. It can also cause early morning awakenings with an inability to return to sleep. You may enjoy a drink or two in the evenings and feel that this has little or no effect on your sleep. You may be right, but the negative effects of alcohol on sleep are often subtle and hard to pin down to the couple of drinks you had around dinner time. You may find yourself using alcohol to help make it easier to get to sleep or return to sleep. Drinking alcohol is one of the most common ways that individuals with insomnia self-medicate. This is problematic as there are some estimates that suggest some cases of alcohol dependence and abuse may be caused by using alcohol in an effort to overcome insomnia. Additionally, over time, frequent use of alcohol can actually have reverse effects, leading to more difficulty getting to sleep rather than less. For these reasons, it's a good idea to avoid drinking alcohol in the evenings. Like caffeine, the only real way to know if alcohol is having an effect on your sleep pattern is to stop using it for a while. Now, what about food? What have you heard about eating before bedtime? Are you supposed to have a snack before bed? Are you not supposed to eat anything after 9 p.m.? Well, this is a bit of a double-edged sword. Eat too much and your body may be trying to digest when you're trying to sleep. And you may had have more acid reflux or GERD, which can disrupt sleep. In fact, my mentor and friend Bill Orr is one of the pioneers of research on what happens when you have GERD during the night. It's not pretty. When you're sleeping, it takes more acid sitting in your esophagus for a longer period of time before you get the feeling of heartburn. This means that you could be having GERD every night and not know that it is the cause of poor quality sleep. On the other hand, you don't want to go to bed hungry. How are you supposed to sleep when your stomach is growling or aching? Okay, here's how to handle it. Avoid meals within two or three hours of bedtime, and a light snack within the hour before bed may actually help you feel sleepier. Now that you have those clear recommendations, you probably have another question. What should I eat for a snack? There are plenty of recommendations out there. 
I don't think there is any right snack, but there are some people who claim that certain types of food are sleep superfoods. Eatingwell.com lists nine foods to help sleep. Fish, especially salmon, give you vitamin B6, which your body can use to make melatonin, a hormone connected to sleep. Bananas, fortified cereals, and chickpeas are also good sources of B6. Jasmine rice, which has a higher glycemic index than regular long rice, can help you fall asleep faster. People who have insomnia sleep better when drinking a cup of tart jerry juice twice a day. It has lots of melatonin in it. Yogurt, which is a high in calcium, may help sleep in folks with low calcium. Green leafy vegetables like kale and collards have a lot of calcium as well. Whole grains like bulgur, barley, contain lots of magnesium and may also help sleep. If these suggestions aren't enough for you, I typed bedtime snacks into Google and came up with 903,000 results in 0.32 seconds. So I'm sure you can find some interesting ideas to try. Okay, next let's talk about the bedroom. How would you describe your bed? Comfy and cozy? Like sleeping on a bed of nails? How would you describe your bedroom? A calming oasis amidst the frenzied chaos of day-to-day -day living? A cave with carpet? Or maybe a second office? Comfort is important. In order to let go into blissful sleep, we need to have a sense of safety and comfort. This means you have to have a comfortable bed. You don't necessarily need to go out and spend thousands on a new bed, but if your mattress looks more like a hammock, it's time for a change. The general recommendation is to replace your mattress every 8 to 10 years. While you're at it, it may be a good idea to get yourself some comfortable pillows and a new blankie as well. This also means you should probably take the time to make your bedroom a place that you can enjoy being. Maybe some nice lighting, some curtains, and a lavender candle or two. Make some effort to make your bedroom a place you can look forward to going at the end of the day. While we're talking about comfort, we also need to talk about light, noise, and temperature. Our bodies were designed to be awake in the daylight and asleep in the dark. So it's important to minimize the amount of light in the bedroom when you're trying to sleep. Basically, you want to have enough light so nobody gets injured making their way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Also, in most cases, it's a good idea to limit the amount of natural light that comes into the bedroom in the mornings, as morning light can be a signal for your brain that it's time to start the day. It probably goes without saying, but a quiet environment is ideal for sleep. But, getting your environment to cooperate can be difficult. Neighbors' dogs and snoring spouses are the most common sources of unwanted nighttime noise. Here's a hint. You're not supposed to sleep when the person you love is choking in the bed right next to you. If they're snoring, choking, or gasping, they should talk to their doctor. There are many solutions to these noises, but most of them aren't very kind. So, what are you to do? There are two main options that you have 100% control over earplugs and white noise. You can find probably 10 different kinds of earplugs at your local drugstore. They may feel a bit uncomfortable for the first few days, but once you get used to them, they may be a great solution. If you're not into earplugs, then consider getting something that generates white noise. This might be a fan or a humidifier. There are also white noise machines that generate a variety of sounds like waterfalls or rainforests. Be careful with these, however. Any sounds that are not constant and meaningless are not technically white noise and have the p potential to disrupt sleep. The TV and audiobooks or the radio are definitely not considered white noise. Unless you're a parent or caregiver who needs to keep an ear out during the night, these can be quite helpful solutions to unwanted noise during the night. Now, what about temperature? There is no right temperature for sleep, but in general you can think that sleep loves the cold. Also, it is usually easier to make the bedroom cold and control your own temperature with sheets and blankets 
than to make the room warm and try to figure out how to keep yourself cool. With this in mind, you'll probably find that a cool bedroom supports a better night's sleep. You shouldn't have caffeine or alcohol too close to bed, but what about nicotine? Is it okay to have a smoke right before bed? What about when you wake up during the night? The bottom line is that whether it's from cigarettes, chewing tobacco, patches, or gum, nicotine is a stimulant. Because of this, nicotine makes it take longer to fall asleep and reduces deep sleep. Given these facts, the best option is to quit. The initial time after quitting can tem be temporarily challenging, but even if you're a long-term smoker who feels that having a cigarette calms you down, you will most likely find that your sleep improves after you quit. With that said, I understand that quitting tobacco is easier said than done. I actually quit smoking about 15 years ago, so I know how difficult it can be. If you're not able to quit, there are some things you can do to minimize the effect of nicotine on your sleep. First, reduce the total amount of nicotine you use each day as much as you're able. Going a little longer than usual between each chew or cigarette, or choosing to skip one every now and then, can sometimes be easy ways to use less. Second, plan to avoid nicotine near bedtime and during middle of the night awakenings. The less nicotine you have in your system, the more likely you will be to sleep deeply. Okay, time for the last healthy sleep habit, exercise. Do you ever try to exhaust yourself by exercising hard for a long time in the hopes of making yourself sleepy? How has that worked for you? If you're like most people, not very well. The relationship between exercise and sleep is not exactly clear. Although there are uh, at least one or two studies that say an hour of moderate exercise four to five hours before bed can reduce bedtime anxiety and help you fall asleep faster, in general it's unlikely that exercise today will help you sleep better tonight. However, individuals who exercise regularly seem to sleep better than those who don't. So, if you're already fairly fit and exercise regularly, then increasing your exercise probably won't help you much. Give yourself a pat on the back for already following this healthy sleep habit. But, if you're not exercising regularly, then changing this habit may have a big impact on your sleep. This appears especially true for older adults and individuals who have anxiety in addition to insomnia. Whatever category you're in, there's at least one clear rule about exercise for healthy sleep. No moderate or high intensity exercise within two or three hours of bedtime. Think about it. When you exercise intensely, your body gets activated and your body temperature increases. If you activate your body, then you have to give it a chance to deactivate in order to be ready for sleep. For most of us, this takes a while. Okay, I've taught you six different healthy sleep habits. Limit caffeine within six hours of bedtime. Make your bed and bedroom as comfortable as possible. Reduce or eliminate nicotine, especially before bed and during the night. Limit alcohol within th two to three hours of bedtime. Eat a light snack around bedtime, but avoid meals within two to three hours of going to bed. Exercise regularly, but not within two or three hours of bedtime. Any one of these can make a difference for you. You know the ones you're already doing, and you know the ones that you need to focus on changing. The more of them you follow, the more likely you are to see a difference in your ability to fall asleep, sleep deeply, wake up less, sleep longer, and feel more rested. You may be thinking that you've heard all of these things before. If so, you may be tempted to ignore them. Just because you've heard them before doesn't mean they're not useful. Don't fall into that trap. These kinds of changes are recommended so often because they're so simple and so important. You may also be thinking that uh, you've tried these things and they haven't worked for you in the past. Keep in mind that consistency is the key to success. 
In order to see the real benefit of these kinds of changes, you probably need to follow them for at least two weeks, maybe more. If you're serious about sleeping better, then I encourage you to commit to making as many of these changes as you're able for at least that long. What if I'm wrong? What if you do the things I've taught you and you don't start sleeping any better? There's still hope. There's a solution to every sleep problem. You just need to find the right support. Start by talking to your primary care or family medicine provider. They may be able to help or they may connect you up with a sleep medicine provider or a behavioral sleep specialist like me. But things like caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, food, exercise, and our sleep environment have a real impact on sleep and they impact sleep in ways that may not be obvious. This means that making the kinds of changes I've suggested offer a real opportunity for better sleep. Which one will you begin to change today? Pick one and begin your journey toward better sleep.